Ladies and gentlemen, I have a confession to make. I am in dire need of a vacation. I have done way too many videos on depressive modes in which the main character is an English schmuck with multiple personality disorder. And looking at Aurora here, I'm pretty sure that things will only get more confusing and depressing from this point onward. We need to relax and cover something simpler. Thankfully, the poll I posted for this month's mod review did me just right. The people want to see me cover the legacy of the Dragonborn, and I shall oblige. Where can I reasonably start with Legacy of the Dragonborn? Well, let me begin by saying that this is one of the most downloaded mods for Skyrim on Nexus mods. So chances are, most people here are at least aware of this mod. If not, they've already played it. So the way I'm gonna cover this mod will not focus so much on the contents of the mod. More so, I will focus on the themes it covers in its many quests. More particularly, in this video, we will be talking about Falmer lore, Dwemer lore, Imperial lore, Nordic lore, Khajiit lore, as well as pointing out some of the item references this mod adds. Of course, I will touch on the new mechanics and the technical improvements, but that won't be the main focus. There are more important stuff to talk about. Who were the Dwemer really? Who was Tower Septum? Really? If the Khajiit are cats, then what are cats in the Elder Scrolls lore? If I were one of the smaller Khajiit, could I, hypothetically, pretend to be just a normal cat and just live rent free on someone's property, without them even knowing that I'm sentient? All these important topics will be answered today. I am also going to be covering Moonpath 2 as well in this video, because it is fully integrated in Legacy, and if you are playing on Legendary Edition, they even come in a single download. I bet everyone who told me to upgrade after the Vigilant video feels really silly now. So, what is Legacy of the Dragonborn? Well, to say that it is a quest mod would drastically undersell it. Legacy of the Dragonborn feels more like Vanilla Plus. It adds a lot of new features that focus around exploring and uncovering new artifacts. There is a new system that allows you to excavate and even craft archaeologies, there are new chests that have unique loot in them, new tools that make exploration easier, and even new loot that comes from Vanilla chests, such as cards that give you buffs and paintings. All these systems are centered around the new main feature of this mod, the Dragonborn Gallery. The Dragonborn Gallery is amazing. The Dragonborn Gallery is supreme. The Dragonborn Gallery makes my neurons fire. It is a storage space and a museum for every single collectible item in Skyrim. And there are also add-ons that are new sections of the museum for other popular mods. But I am a minimalist. I only want one gallery for one other mod. Can you guess what mod I'm talking about? The more you fill up the museum with artifacts, and the more you play around with the vanilla game, the more activities become available to you. The quality of these activities range anywhere from find shiny thingy and place it in the museum right next to other shiny thingy so you can admire the shiny thingies altogether, to full-blown excavation missions that take you to long-lost ruins and important places outside of Skyrim. One of the good things about this mod, I think, is that all these quests are very rarely interconnected. Most of them deal with different isolated instances and focus on different lore themes with only a few recurring characters between them. Personally, this is very good for me because for one video, I get to not follow the pattern of telling the viewer that this is important and that they should remember it for later, only for that later to come. An hour into the video. This video isn't like that. This video is a curation in which I will take you through all the important lore this mod has brought forth. And um, this doesn't mean that there is no mystery to explain. But what I am saying is that no one lost their names this time. Before we dive in, I want to note the mod's biggest strength and one of its biggest weaknesses as well. The quest line of this mod, narratively wise, is pretty good. There are a few token quests such as the Haunted Museum quest that incorporate every single stereotype of a haunted house under the sun, and all of other quests end with a good old belly laugh that just makes you feel like you're playing through a sitcom. However, to me at least, these factors are easily overshadowed by the mod's ability to use the Elder Scrolls concept of the unreliable narrator to its fullest extent. You will see this soon enough with the quest much ado about the former, but this mod isn't afraid to shower the player with a bunch of conflicting historical documents and tell them to make sense out of them. And this makes you feel like a researcher, especially if you're taking the time to read the books as you go along. So the plot is, aha, uh, bussin. But if I had to actually rate the mechanics of the quests as an elementary teacher, I would simply comment, well, they certainly approach the topic with enthusiasm, however, their work leaves much to be desired. There is so much backtracking, this mod lies in the uncanny realm of some things have quest marks indicating that they are needed, and others do not. So you might miss an item only for it to be needed 10 minutes later. And that's not even the worst part. Some quests require specific artifacts to unlock certain areas, but it doesn't tell you the artifacts are needed for the quest, until you are well on your way to it. So you will be two loading screens and 50 minutes of walking in a dungeon, only to find a slot that requires a ring that you do not have, and backtrack all the way back to get said artifact, only for them to come back, use said artifact to unlock the door, and find another door that requires another artifact. And this can happen for about, um, four times. And before you ask, Yes, it is just as annoying as I am making it out to be. There is of course a way to relieve yourself of this issue. Google the quests ahead of starting them and get the artifacts in advance. 
you're welcome. As a final note, I want to mention that, as with all these mods we cover on this channel, the things mentioned here are lore friendly, but they aren't exactly canon. The reason why I'm mentioning this here is because with the other mods, it is kind of obvious that they are not canon, unfortunately, because of how out of there they are, and because of how separated from the base game they are. But this mod is very grounded in Skyrim's plot and questing, so I feel like it's very easy to get lost in the sauce per se. So I will make sure to mention when the mod's authors are taking their own creative decisions, because it's not always obvious. For example, I saw a lot of people's opinions about the mod, and a sizable point of criticism was that there are about 1000 artifacts from all across time and space in Tamriel that all ended up in Skyrim at the same time for some reason, and some of them are thrown there without any convincing backstory behind them. In a more comedic note, there are a bunch of automated repeatable quests, and all of them play out the same, with the same dialogues and the same reward, and in one of them, an NPC goes Dovahkiin. Please, go find Sander. Wait, you mean one of the three tools of Kagranak Sander? You mean touch it the wrong way and you instantly die Sander? Sander as in Sander the heart of Lorcan? Sander the heart of the world Sander? Sander as in Sander these nuts in your mouth Sander? You want me to go pick up that Sander? Yes Dragonborn, I will give you a fart's worth of gold for it. To that piece of criticism, I can only say this, fair is fair, but to me, headcanon is still the best canon. I simply choose to believe that the intense Chim power of the Dragonborn pulls all these artifacts together. What does Chim have to do with a bunch of artifacts, you may ask? Um, um, good question. Um, let's see, um, shut up. And with all that out of the way, let us finally talk about the legacy of the Dragonborn. The first quest in this mod begins when you enter the museum. You see, we are in need of a vast array of relics to display here at the museum. And I'm afraid that the mercenaries and treasure hunters I've hired thus far have proven to be more trouble than they are worth. Perhaps I can give you a chance, however. If you can bring me a few artifacts I'm looking for, I'll pay you for them. If you prove to be successful at retrieving these relics for me, perhaps we can discuss some other opportunities I may have for you. This is your basic go there, collect stuff kind of quest. This one has a lot of them and I'm not gonna mention each and every single one of them because we'll be here all day. Instead, only VIPs will be mentioned. We bring the artifacts back to Arian, who is the owner of the museum, he gives us a quick tour of the place and he offers us a position as a relic hunter for the museum. And thus, the more officially kicks off. Something I should note is that this museum is extremely well made. There is a notice board informing you of how many artifacts are in the museum at all times. There is an area that automatically places the artifacts for you. A chest in the entrance that collects the revenue and makes it available to you. A curator's guide which tells you amongst other things where Aryan is at all times which is brilliant because you're gonna have to talk to him a lot and this museum can feel rather labyrinthian at times. I have played this mod from beginning to end around four times now and I do not recall any bugs or glitches substantial enough to inhabit my memory for a prolonged period of time. Sometimes the dialogue cuts off prematurely. So it's rather curious that Malok would be sending Tulrin to claim the blade. It's almost as if the twice spurned Falmer are being played by some other force or Malok has some other plan for the blade. That's about all the technical issues I can recall. Oh, and there's also this. Hey, don't tell anyone I told you this, but the museum has a bunch of secrets in it. For example, there are three hidden pressure plates on the walls of the museum, and if you press all three of them together at a quick succession, you can unlock a unique artifact by going to the dining area. It takes forever. With the quantity of items added, some of them will fall off the world sometimes. This is truly a tragedy. Please, Mr. Funny Cake W YouTube man, what can be done about this? Here's this command, and here's this website with the full item catalog, and here's this other command that tells you the exact order this mod has on your mod file, because you're gonna need it. Yes, almighty voice from the abyss. But what do I do if I'm playing on an Xbox? Well, by the words of American philosopher Chance Wilkins, then sit and rotate. The first big quest I want to mention requires no particular amount of artifacts to begin. It simply requires you complete the Dormer quest in Markarth given by Kalkelmo. A few days after you complete those quests, along with Legacy's induction, a carrier shows up with a letter. Your hands only. Your hands only. During my own going work translating the former tongue, I have come across references to several important snow of artifacts. If they still exist, they could have great historical and magical significance. The discovery of these ancient former caches gives me hope that the Dwemer may have also held on to snow elven artifacts of importance, rather than having melted them down for scraps as was previously assumed. Now Kalkelmo is a vanilla NPC, meaning they had to chop his dialogue to make it work. There are ancient references to old artifacts. What little I could learn suggests they may be what I need to complete my research. 
It is very humbling to see the sacred arts of mixing and mashing dialogue together that gave birth to this channel in the first place resume to this day. Here, it's all in these notes. And the Snow Princess Stuart took refuge with the Dwemer of Eligible with the rest of the cold court, keeping his lord's possession safe, and he undertook the task of ensuring that at least the priceless eyes of the great statue made it safely from the palace, temple, to its new home. This must be referring to Eringthant, and as the Dwemer had closed off all other access to their northern seat, Blackridge, the sisterhood of sky colors, having been loath to trust the Dwemer and their bargain of refuge, finally accepted the hospitality of the last city willing to take them in. One of the last Dwemer cities in Blackridge, then. Perhaps the librarian at Winterhold College knows something about this. It is still unknown why the Dwemer thought it would be prudent to insist that the House of the Sunlight could only accept refuge under the watchful eye of the God, Great One. Of Zrip. It was not looked on favorably by those, nor by the Snow Princess court, but there was no other alternative. Must research. A Dwemer temple? Zrip? Preposterous. Must be something else. Perhaps a temple to a god that predated the Dwemer. Perhaps the priesthood of the Nine keeps archives about former competition, and will have something on this Zrip. Why does that name sound so familiar? So we go to ask the library of the College of Winterhold if they have any leads, and um, no, no, not this month. Stop chasing me. Please stop. I'll cover you next, I swear. Found you, I did. <laughs> right, yeah, library. So we search around the library for a while and find nothing of actual substance until the librarian hands us a book called Dwemer History and Culture. This book epitomizes what I said earlier about this mod's proclivity to use the concept of the unreliable narrator to deliver its narrative. It is a large academic essay debunking a popular yet inaccurate series of accounts about the Dwemer. This is good and all, but it says nothing we actually care about, so we are given another book that has something we care about. But before I read it, I just want to remind you all that the story of the Snow Elves was that they inhabited Skyrim before the Nords showed up from Atmora during the Merithic era, and when the Nords showed up and started procreating in their lands, they saw how quickly they were expanding, and so, one night, they orchestrated the massacre of Sarthal, in an event known as the Night of Tears. Isgram and his sons who survived the sagging, then came back with their papa and massacred every single elf, and this is where this book picks up from. I have studied, and traveled, and explored, and observed, and my hypothesis has been confirmed, that the twisted former that inhabit the darkest depths of Skyrim are indeed the Snow Elves of legend. No one really knows when the story of the Snow Elves began, but the ancient work of Fall of the Snow Elves which is the account of the Battle of Moestring, as transcribed by Lockheed, chronicler of chieftain Ingrard Wairai, gives a rather vivid account of its ending. According to this eyewitness account, the great former leader known only as the Snow Prince died in glorious battle. The remaining Snow Elves were scattered or slain, and were never heard of again, or so many thought. But when the story of the ancient Snow Elves ends, that of the current day former begins. For when the Snow Elf host was shattered on that fateful day, it did not simply disperse. It descended. The former sought sanctuary in the most unlikely of places, Blackridge, far beneath the surface of Skyrim, in the legendary realm of the Dwemer themselves. Blackridge exists. I have been there, and unlike most of those who have witnessed its terrible glories, I have returned, and I know the truth about the Falmer. After their defeat by the Nords, the dwarves agreed to protect the Falmer, but at a terrible price, for these Dwemer did not trust their snow of guests, and forced them to consume a toxic fungi that once grew deep underground, and as a result, the Snow Elves were rendered blind. Soon, the majestic Snow Elves were rendered powerless. They began as the Dwarf Servants, and then their slaves. But the Dwemer's treachery was so deep, so complete, that they made the fungi an essential part of the farmer's diet. This guaranteed the weakness, not only of their current former thralls, but their offspring as well. The Snow Elves, for time eternal, would be blind. But as is always the story with slaves and their masters, the former eventually rebelled. Generations after they sought solace amongst the dwarves and experienced bitter betrayal, the former rose up against their oppressors. They overthrew the dwarves and fled even further down, into Black Reach's deepest, most hidden reaches. For decade upon decade, the two sides waged a bitter conflict, a fully fledged and bloody War of the Crag that reached deep below Skyrim's surface, completely unbeknownst to the Nords above, a war whose battles and heroes must forever remain lost to our knowledge. Until one day, the war ended. For on that day, the former went to meet their Dwemer foes in battle, only to find out that their entire race had vanished. Finally free from the threat of their Dwemer overlords, the farmer were able to spread freely throughout Blackridge, but years of fighting the dwarves had left them bloodthirsty and brutal. And so the legends began, of small, blind, goblin-like creatures who would rise from the cracks of the earth in the dead of night to slaughter cattle, attack lonely travelers, and steal sleeping babies from their cribs. In recent years, however, the sightings of these creatures have become more and more frequent, their raids more organized, and their attacks more brutal. In fact, 
One might even come to the conclusion that the Fulmer are ready to change once again. Could it be true? Are the snows of the past ready to reclaim their long forgotten glory? Are they ready to search to the surface and make war upon the light dwellers? If that happens, if the former are indeed planning to reconquer Skyrim, I fear a horror neither man nor gods could possibly stand against. And that is foreshadowing. Everything we talked about so far is still pretty good and canonical, but the third book, which we can find in the ruins of Zuft, gives an entirely new perspective to the story, from a different angle. The Order of the Sky Sisters, as the Snows called them, waited until the human hordes were almost upon them before finally taking refuge in the last remaining Dwemer city to offer them hospitality. It is said that the Sky Sisters were more suspicious of the Dwemer and their intentions than the other Snow Houses, and therefore held back initially. Eventually, faced with the inevitability of the coming onslaught, they had no choice but to accept the terrible bargain and take refuge in the depths of Alphant. It is said by some scholars that the Sky Sisters were the first group of Snow Elves to be fed the poisonous algae, and therefore discover the Dwemer's true intent, the enslavement of their entire race. There are references in Dwemer text in this wing of Alphon being sealed shut after an incident there, although no scholar to my knowledge has ever discovered further explanation of what occurred there. So, what was that incident? Well, I will tell you that when we get there. Alphon itself is a solemn and long sealed in ice, and instead we can find a ghostly visage of a snow elf guiding us through the place. <laughs> We can also find wisps roaming the place, speaking a garbled tongue. We may never find out what they are talking about, as that tongue has been long lost to time and oh my god they're just talking backwards. Must kill, you must die. So we get the artifacts from this place, as well as a key for the third ruin. Oh, and by the way, we're supposed to go through three of these ruins. Something else I want to note is that whenever you take an artifact and then try to leave these ruins, a snow of shit attacks you. And even the ghostly visage that guided us through these dungeons eventually transforms in one of those shades at the end. But it clearly doesn't wish to do so. So what's happening here? This is never explicitly stated anywhere, uh, to my knowledge at least, but the ghostly visage, the wisps and the snow of shades are all that remains of the Sky Sisters. It seems that after they became aware of their own fate, they decided to go down in their own terms and they cursed these Dwemer ruins to protect their sacred artifacts and to forever haunt their Dwemer oppressors. And in a tragic twist of fate, they became just like the rest of their blinded kin, rotten with a mind of savagery and violence. To find out where the second temple is, we need to go to the temple in solitude and read a book which mentions a god of the Dwemer known as Rip. Now, again, this plays into the unreliable narrator theme. This statement is completely nonsensical. Not only did the Dwemer believe in no gods, but there were also full-on redditors who hated the concept of divinity and sought to raise themselves as gods. So then, who is this Rip and why is she texting you? Well, at the back of the book, we find a letter which reads, A Dwemer God? What kind of research went into making this ridiculous series? Kind reader, let me direct you to the legacy of the Dwemer Paragons. There you will discover the truth of who Zip really was, Cal Kelmo, Dwemer Scholar. So we ask Cal Kelmo about this, and he directs us to yet another book, Zrip and the title of Paragon, by being the primary inventor of the science behind the creation of the automatons. He was the researcher who first discovered the way to breathe life into the constructs that changed Dwemer society forever. This breakthrough led to the bulk of the Dwemer people leading lives of relative leisure. They were able to focus on other pursuits, such as the continued advancement of Dwemer engineering. My research indicates that Zrip's university was most likely located in northern Instaskari, possibly underneath the very mountain where a monument to his, hers, godhood can be found. In the temple of Zrip, we can find the ghostly visage that guides us again, and some more artifacts. The last dungeon is also the most inconsequential, it just requires materials from the other two dungeons to be fully accessed, and in it the ghostly visage from earlier switches back and forth between attacking us and not attacking us. Again we pick up some more relics, report our findings to Kalkelmo, and after a while he donates the relics we found to the museum. Obsessed with the Dwemer. Took off north saying he had found some old artifact. Haven't seen him since. I think one of those volumes may have had some relevant information. If you want them, we'll have to talk to Orthorn. I said earlier that the quest in this mod aren't really interconnected with one another, except this one, so keep some of the finer details in mind. After a while of picking up artifacts, we're given the opportunity to build the Explorer Society, and I do mean that literally. Oh yeah, Orion might have enough money to build a museum where a temple of Talos once was, but building another room for the guild? Now that's too much. My idea was that we could form a guild such as here at the museum. Call it the Explorer Society, and members could combine their efforts and collaborate to investigate more ruins, uncover more legends and lost lore. 
The fruits of any labor sponsored by the guild would be displayed here. This could take some of the workload off of you and provide a new source of people and information that you could utilize on larger ventures. So please, Dragonborn, Dova King, go become Bob the Builder real quick. Hold on, Skyfred. Yes, the rest of Skyrim is a much alien place to this guy. I am one of a few who venture beyond our home. Wait, I think I know this guy. Son! Mom! How much you have changed in such short time! Gentle rain washed away the blood and healed my pain. What a way to have a recurring character. Once the house is built, we need to recruit our Avengers team of nerds. We have the book guy. I really love reading and everybody needs to know. A merchant. Dragons, in your own homeland. What are you going to do? This one does not know, but he hopes his family is safe in Riverhall. It's a dragon! Run! Merchant. A sci-fi nerd stereotype, the fairy, a miner, and an actual professor who, definitely, mind you, won't die halfway through the quest because he's the only non-applicable character. Before we get to what happens from this point onwards, let me engage in what I would like to describe as a fairy interlude. Here is where Moonpath to Elsewhere begins. <laughs> Path to Elsewhere isn't exactly a huge DLC sized mod like the others we've covered on this channel. It's a simple mod with a few simple quests, a simple structure, and a few new places. At the very least, it's a nice change of scenery from tundras and snowy mountains to deserts and jungles. So to begin the mod, we need to go outside Falkrig where we can find a Khajiiti caravan member called Varina. And uh, wait, what the hell are they talking about over there? Someday I'll find out. Someday. Are you Kurana's mate? Perhaps I am. Well, mostly. All cats stray from time to time. Excuse me, do you mind? As you can tell, recording this mod did not go so well. It also doesn't lend itself well to my usual style of covering quest mods, so instead of going through the usual motions, I'm gonna go through a lot of Khajiit lore, and then I will explain the plot of Moonpath to Oswar, and how that plot ultimately concluded. I feel like this is way preferable to me rather than the alternative, which would be to let a lot of Khajiit dialogue play out, and then having to pause every two seconds to explain said dialogue. Especially because this dialogue doesn't have anything to deep dive on or any deeper mystery, this mod is just a little window in what is happening to another corner of Tamriel at the same time as Skyrim. The story of the Khajiit is just as simple, basic, and straightforward as the rest of the Elder Scrolls lore, which is to say that there are multiple different interpretations for the origins of the Khajiit. One account says that they existed in Tamriel long before Men and Mer got there. Other sources claim that they came from Odalmafi, yet as they arrived in the land that would come to be known as elsewhere, they were reshaped by Azura to what they are today. I should note two things here. It is completely possible that they left Old Alnafe, settled in elsewhere, became the Khajiit, and then the elves that came after them saw them and thought to themselves, where the fuck did these fairies come from? I should also note that the account of them being shaped by Azura comes from a Khajiiti clan mother called Anisi, and it is way too flattering of an account to not raise an eyebrow over. It mentions that Azura told them a bunch of secrets, and it also made them out to be the fastest race, the sneakiest race, and also the most cunning race. If that doesn't sound like a grandma story, I don't know what does. Throughout the mod, there are also a lot of references to the main. So there are about 17 types of Khajiit, ranging from cats, as in cats cats, to big cats, buffed tiger cats, the humanoid version of the Khajiit which we know and love, and gigantic or smaller versions of that humanoid type. What type of Khajiit one will be is determined by the placement of the moons at the time of their birth. By the way, the two moons are called Joan and Jode, and they are essential to Khajiit religion. But about every lifetime, a third moon shows up. And so when a third moon shows up, it leads to the birth of the main, who is to function as a spiritual leader for the entire race. Mains can only be found in elsewhere, and there can only be one main at a time. I really like this detail that the reason they are called mains is because when the Khajiit were a small tribe, they would cut off their own mains and offer them to her as a symbol of respect and reverence. And the maid would never cut hers. Then as their population grew, this practice became increasingly more infeasible. Although, in fairness, that would be pretty funny. Can you just imagine, you go to meet the clandestine leader of an entire race, born under three moons, and just as you're about to meet them, you enter a room full of fur, and a voice is yelling at you telling you, sorry, it's kinda hard to hear you with all this fur pile on to me. When it comes to the fundamentals of the religion of the Khajiit, they aren't terribly different from that of other religions, but the names can be kind of different. For example, Akatosh is pronounced Alkosh. There are a few unique deities such as Joan and Jode, and other smaller deities such as a god for thieves, who are less important but still there. The main tree of gods that make up the core of their beliefs 
Arazura, Akatosh, and Lorcan. And here's where we get to the Riddle Thar. So the first main of the Khajiit was called Riddle Thar Tara, and that main was a prophet that talked about Riddle Thar as a messenger of the gods or a deity of order. Yet it was more akin to a set of rules set out for the Khajiit. The Khadfar of elsewhere are very loyal to Akatosh, or Alkosh as they call him, they revere Azura, and they certainly do not like Lorcan. The rules in Riddle Thar talk about how to avoid the path of Lorcan. By the way, they're going with the whole Lorcan is a trickster and a deceiver interpretation of the myth of creation. The path of Lorcan is associated with everything that makes a bad Khajiit. Mindless thievery, skooma addiction, lying, resorting to violence, that kind of stuff. Another big part of their beliefs is the idea of the paths. According to them, there is a path behind the moons, and every Khajiit goes there after they die, and that is described as an endless sun path. There's the path of Lorcan which we already talked about, and there is also a righteous path that is associated with Alkosh. And in reference to this video, the moon paths are less of a defined path and more of an instinct of the Khajiit that tells them where to go and where to trade, and it can be completely random. Hence why so many of them complain about ending up at Skyrim. Well, you tell me. We've traveled on one. In short, they are the secret paths of the Khajiit caravans to use to move between the provinces. Magical? Ha! <laughs> Of course, following the moons to one's destination is always deeply magical experience for a Khajiit, but sparkly magic? No. Right, now that we have given just enough context, and this is by no means a detailed analysis of this topic, we can talk about where the card folks are today. So after the events of Oblivion, the Thalmor took credit for Martin's sacrifice, and they ended up taking control of Somerset, and in time they expanded their sphere of influence to Velenwood as well. And then, by sheer dumb coincidence, in the year 78 of the 4th era, the main was mysteriously assassinated. And later on in the year 98, the two moons completely disappeared from the sky, which for the Khajiit is not a good thing. One might even say that it is a complete disaster. But fear not, for just two years later, the Thalmor brought back the moons using their newly developed Dawn magic. How did they develop this magic? I don't know. Why didn't they do this like two years ago? I don't know. If it has the power to bring back the moons, then can it also theoretically make them disappear? Is this magic older than two years old? Hey there, that's too many questions you're asking. All that matters right here and right now is that the benevolent elven supremacists have helped the plagued people of elsewhere to overcome their greatest trouble yet, at a time when their own main had been mysteriously assassinated. And that's how elsewhere joined the Third Old Mary Dominion. Now, that's good and all, but what about the more? Have you forgotten about the more, Mr. Internet Man? Yes, I am very aware of the more. Before I talk about the more, I want to mention one last thing, Moon Sugar. Moon Sugar is perhaps the funniest aspect of this entire plot. It is a holy substance for the Khajiit, and it's also a huge export for the region. It is described as crystallized moonlight, found in the Tobol Sea and transported to the sugar canes of the farmlands by the tides which is the most out there way I have ever heard anyone describe the production of nose candy. It is said that ingesting it makes you feel like walking the endless suns behind the moons, which uh oh, it's gonna be it's gonna be a spicy clown behind those moons, huh? Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Originally the substance was banned under the Empire, but the Altmeri Dominion decided to legalize it again, with mixed results. The mod portrays the picture that not all Khajiit bought the story I just mentioned about mysteriously assassinated mains and conveniently respawning and despawning moons, and so a group of rebels began opposing the Thalmor ruling elsewhere, and for those rebels in the Tobol Sea, moon sugar became a valuable export. In the moon path to elsewhere, we're tasked with assisting these rebels by hunting down a Thalmor justiciary and riding from location to location on an airship. It was cool, but it was also not worth narrating over for half an hour just to say that we killed the justiciar, found an unmapped small island, and decided to turn it into a new base of operations while also retrieving the staff of Indaris. Oh, you are from the museum in Skyrim, no? Wonderful. Rakis is glad you have made it here safely, and he is sorry for the troubles in bringing you here. But as you have plainly seen, Elsewhere has great troubles. During the First Dominion, Elsewhere was a protectorate of the Almiri Dominion, a reluctant ally, if you will. And now that the Dominion has risen once more, it seeks to bring Elsewhere under its thumb once again. There are those of us who would not have this. So Rakis happens upon this relic a number of years ago, brings it into his safekeeping, but word spreads swiftly on the warm winds of elsewhere. And now the Thalmor seek to obtain it. Every piece of power they get their hands on brings them that much closer to dominating all of Tamriel. And so Rakis gives to you the Staff of Indaris, so that you may safekeep it, and keep it from the clutches of the Thalmor. And may the blessings of the Clan Mothers be with you. After what you have achieved here, the Thalmor are sure to take more notice of you. 
the stuff is actually a reference to Oblivion. Back then it belonged to the Dark Earth Count of Channel Hall before the Champion of Cyrodiil procured it. And they give us this stuff along with an airship just so the Thalmor don't get them. So that was Moonpath to elsewhere. There were some details I didn't mention like the side quest about a sloat, but uh... I got bronchitis. Ain't nobody got time for that. Alright, back to the main mod. There's quite a few activities we can partake in before we get into the main juice. There's a hidden bottle in the Dragomore Hall which unlocks a hidden chamber under the Blue Palace in which we can store items that are not exactly fit for a museum. In the guild house there is also a book that details the escapades of other explorers that came before us and gives us the location of their unique artifacts as well as their own items. This is the quest that I personally had the most fun messing around with. The items can be pretty useful here. For example, there's a torch that never runs out of fuel, and there's also a backpack that drastically increases your inventory space. The exploration is also very unique, and the artifacts you get can make you fill up the museum really quick, so it's really nice that this quest becomes available to you only 150 artifacts into the mod. There's a lot of smaller quests throughout the mod, like the repeatable quest Aryan gives you, as well as the many scattered quests throughout the world. Oh come on, you're just making it too easy now. To give you an example, if you discover a book called Lost Wonders to the Ages Volume 3, you can start a quest line to recover the armor of Pelinal Whitestrake. Arian also places notes on artifacts of higher importance in his office, and you can pick them up to receive an unmarked quest regarding the item. I wanna get to the really juicy part of the mod story, aka the expeditions, but before that there are two quests I wanna mention real quick that help provide a bit more context about the museum. The first one is called Another the Museum, and during it the museum closes and it will not open again until we have a priest of arcade to get Get rid of your ghost that haunts it. This quest is just one big spooky horror story stereotype. You got the items being thrown at you from the shelves, children ghosts, children laughing, someone even says the look behind you line, and at some point, um, I, I don't want to talk about this quest that much. The quest eventually ends when we found out that the entity who is haunting the museum was the building's original founder, who originally built it to be a temple for Talos. But during its construction, his wife died, and he would soon go on to join her, and as a last son of remembrance to his wife, he wants a statue of her to be placed outside the entrance to the museum. And with just how basic this quest is, you will all be surprised to know that the second quest I want to mention is somehow even more rudimentary than this one. Shadows of One's Past is a quest in which a guard of the museum turns out to be an ex-member of a Redcat bandit group who gives up on their previous life in an attempt to start a more legitimate work. However, his brother tracks him down, beats him up, and loots the museum. We find the brother, we tell him to stop, he says no XD, we kill him, and on the road we find all the artifacts we lost. And that's the quest. Although these quests are pretty inconsequential, I still appreciate them because they present the museum in a different state that we have never seen before. At this point, if you were playing the mod, you would have been inside and out of the museum for about a hundred times by now, and it always feels like the same orderly place you go to to store your items and have your neurons fire because you're seeing a bunch of shiny items on display, much like seeing some jiggly keys and not being able to touch them. But in this quest, you see it as a wreck, and it feels very weird, unsettling. That's how it felt to me at least. After completing this quest, Professor Marassi shows up and suggests that you and the team should embark on some expeditions to uncover some long forgotten structures, and the first one you go to is the Wall and Wind Colors Pass. Something to be noted about these expeditions, with the exception of the last one, there is barely anything new to them. They just act as world building devices. If your memory of Skyrim's vanilla quest is hazy, then allow me to remind you that Jurgen Windcaller was the founder of the Order of the Greybeards. Arngir has this to say about him. He was a great war leader of the ancient Nords, a master of the voice or tongue. After the disaster at Red Mountain, where the Nord army was annihilated, he spent many years pondering the meaning of that terrible defeat. He finally came to realize that the gods had punished the Nords for their arrogant and blasphemous misuse of the voice. He was the first to understand that the voice should be used solely for the glory and worship of the gods, not the glory of men. Jürgen Windcaller's mastery of the voice eventually overcame all opposition and the way of the voice. Was born. This expedition is very straightforward. Dig up the temple he made as an offering twice in time, and kill the two dragons he tasked to guard the place and guard his own artifacts after he gave up on killing people with the voice, and that's it. The second expedition takes place in the Doma ruins of Urgund. This expedition is my favorite one gameplay wise, but story wise, it doesn't have much. It's an endearing story about the Dwemer leader and architect called Garagas making a tomb for his own daughter right under his own tower. The tower itself is full of artifacts, gold, rare books, and blueprints which you can use to create a planetarium for the museum. What makes 
this expedition stand out for me are the puzzles. Sure, it can be annoying when you hit the same dead end for the 20th time, but you're playing Skyrim. You can just throw a random item at the beginning to mark where you have already been. This has been said a lot, but I feel the need to say it again. Why? is their golden coins of the current imperial dynasty in a tomb that predates the empire. Overall, I'd say pretty good expedition. Now the third and final expedition is also the biggest one and the one with the most actual plot, other than, you know, mindless grave robbing. About 10 days after we complete the second expedition, we get a message on screen which reads, A strange feeling just rushed through my head, and my vision was momentarily blurred. I started hearing some strange chimes, and you would think these were all in my head, but the sound of those chimes is coming from a specific direction, as if leading me towards something. When we follow that direction, we find the ghostly visage from the matchup about the former quest, and this time it guides us to another forgotten former ruin. Excited about the prospect of a new discovery, we bring this news to the society, and the third expedition officially begins. A few things to note about this expedition, it is the largest one and the most comprehensive one, but it is also the worst one gameplay wise. Here is how this expedition plays out. You go to the cave, you find a locked door which you cannot pick the lock off, and Orion then goes, ah yes, I recognize the shape of this keyhole, the keyhole matches perfectly with the legendary artifact known as Kagernak's left testicle. I have spent many years of my life searching for that artifact. Dragonborn. Have I ever told you the story behind Kagranak's left testicle? You see, Kagranak used to spend a lot of time playing around with pressurized steam and screws, and one day, as he was mending to his machines, one of those screws loosened up due to the steam, which propelled it forward like a rocker, and landed on his… well, you know where. To replace his great loss, he invented a new mechanical testicle, and when the entire race of Dumer disappeared, it alone was left behind. Legend has it, Dovakin, that it remained there, in the Red Mountain, for centuries, until it was retrieved by none other than Dagoth Ur, who kept it in his pocket for good luck. When he too despawned, the mighty artifact was rediscovered by a Dark Elf Dwemer Restorationist organization, which came to be called the Order of the Righteous Testicle but the Order fell into inner conflict and disarray after the eruption of the Red Mountain. It is said that an apostate of the Order stole the mighty artifact and then fled to Skyrim, where he eventually threw it inside the old leg in Alta and was then eaten by Crawfish. Dovahkiin, Dragonborn, you need to get out of this cave, go through three loading screens along the way, and go to Lake Elenata and start killing the fishes there, until you find this most important piece of Tamrielic history. We will sit here pretty and wait for you. Then, once you do all that and open the door, there is another door, like two minutes later. Ah, yes. Dovakin. The slot in this door matches perfectly with yet another artifact that I have been researching by sheer another coincidence. Tell me, almighty oh dragonborn, have I ever told you the tale behind Pelennol's foreskin? It is said that when the alien princess cut him into pieces, after he defeated Umeril the Unfeathered, they took the foreskin to an undisclosed location, where they proceeded to- This goes on for about four doors. On god just google the expedition and bring everything in advance. This ain't worth the time or effort. Early in the expedition we find a former tone written in the former tongue, and we are then ambushed by a former named Durin Deathweaver. While trying to leave the cave we stumble and fall and pass out for about a week, and when we wake up we learn that everyone survived except Marasi. Oh no! Anyway! We then gain access to the translated version of the former tone we found inside the cave. The great heresy of Yere shall forever entomb the great evil of our folly. Only by the tone of his voice shall the chamber open, though through Malok the tool of our revenge shall be freed, and the world above shall burn, and the former will feel the light of day once more. A great death weaver will come, he shall be given voice amongst the silent, be given sight amongst the blind, and he shall lead us to our destiny. So now we know that the former have made contact with Malakath to gain more power. Malakath, for those of you that don't know, is the god of the fallen, shamed, exiled, and dishonored. Or more specifically, the god of the orcs. Malakath has always been an interesting case of a Daedra, mainly because he wasn't originally a Daedra. He was, however, the most powerful Aedra, second only to Akatosh. And he was once very celebrated even amongst the elves. What happened was that during the Dawn era, a cult began sprouting in the Somerset Isles, and its leader was an elf by the name of Veloth. Veloth preached that he was receiving messages from Trinamak to go inhabit the land that would come to be known as Morrowin, but the visions were actually coming from Boethia. So the real Trinamak challenged Boethia to a duel and tried to warn the elves not to go to Morrowin, knowing that it would be a dangerous journey and that the land they would go to inhabit would be a dangerous one. From here there are two different retellings of the duel. One goes that Trinamak was about to kill Boethia when Mafala stabbed him in the back and cursed him to be reborn as the Daedra known as Malakath. The other one goes that Boethia not only won decisively but she also ate Trinamak and then relieved herself of him as Malakath. Yep, that sounds like something a Daedra would come up with. And now the mod makes the case that the former sought to gain power from this Daedra to help them rebel against the world above. And how did they plan to get that power? Well Mafala and Boethia weren't exactly the only Daedra that screwed with Malakath. One day, Shiogorath tricked Malakath and gave him the plate of treachery, which has the power to turn the wielder mad and kill everyone around them due to the madness, 
and it's during this madness that Malakath killed his own son, and the former seek this blade so they can give it to the people of the overworld to stir up chaos so they can invade. We follow them around to where the blade is, complete an interesting puzzle, and then open the door to the blade, and then this Death Weaver character shows up and says, aha, this was all part of my master plan all along, you shall all die now, twirl moustache, twirl moustache. So we kill him, pack our bags, and then go back to the museum, having completed the last expedition, but if you're not, for the best, always comes last. The last sizable quest of the legacy of the Dragomon I want to talk about is Shattered Legacy. If you display 550 or more artifacts in the museum, Aryan will give you the Sword of Many Tanks, which will trigger an NPC interaction with a wounded Imperial named Byron. Help! Help me! Please, take this. You must keep it safe. Away from... <coughs> Never we are then attacked by members of the Morang Tong. The letter on him reads, The hope of the Empire and that of Mundus itself lies in part in your hands now, good Byron. I fear that, even now, our enemies prime their machinations against us. Reforming the Chimela the Valley is of the utmost importance if the rumors are true. Guard these shards well, and may Akatosh protect you. Guardian Thoros. We go to Orion to hear his comments about this shard, and this is what he has to say. Yes? Interesting. Do you have a question? Interesting. It looks like a broken ruby of some kind. No, not a ruby, but rather... Oh my, this couldn't possibly, could it? I, I believe this may be a shard of the Amulet of Kings. At the end of the Oblivion Crisis, Martin Septim sacrificed himself to banish Mayroon's Dagon and seal the gates, which shattered the amulet in the process, breaking the covenant with Akatosh. There were reportedly five shards which have been safeguarded by the Imperial Cult, but after the invasion of the White Gold Tower and the White Gold Concordant, they were lost. They have been rumored to pass between Guardians, who would protect them until a means of supposedly reforming the amulet is found. Apparently someone associated with the Daedra are seeking these fragments. I'll do some research and let you know when I turn up. The shard you carry does in fact appear to be one from the Shattered Amulet of Kings, and I have discovered that the other fragments are quite possibly here in Skyrim. The Guardians of the Shard believe that the Dragonfire could remake the amulet, and must be converging here to seek the aid of a dragon. They may not even be aware that they are being hunted, like this Byron fellow who found you. Perhaps you should find them to warn them. I would probably advise starting your search at High Hrothgar, as they seem to be a central authority on dragon lore. We then got a High Hrothgar, and there is in fact another Guardian there. We tell him that we're not here to harm him, and he tells us to find another Guardian that went missing in the Pell Pass. We find her and bring her back, but on the way we also find another important artifact, the Shield of Riemann Cyrodiil, and a book called The Remenada. And I will read that book later on, when there's a bunch of other weird stuff happening and it's actually useful. After we take her back, we retrieve the last shot of the amulet from the last Guardian, learn that these guys are actually hired thugs just like the Morak Tong, kill them as well, and then bring the pieces back to the museum. Curious. Well, I'm glad you pulled through intact, my friend. And the result of your venture is really quite an amazing find. The Amulet of Kings. But that's not all. It seems that the shield and the fragments are resonating with one another in some way, as if they are attuned to one another. I think I may have some more insight into this, but I want to be certain. Can you come back in a few days? That would give me enough time to check a few things before delving into a lengthy tale. I want to note something important about this particular quest. This quest works as an interlude between Legacy of the Dragonborn and a future mod which will be released by these developers, Odyssey of the Dragonborn. So don't be bothered by technicalities such as who hired these guys or how the Morak Tong got involved in all this yet. The amulet pieces and the shield both react with one another because their connection to the covenant of Akatosh made with Alessia. Queen Alessia's soul was bound to the Amulet of Kings in the Covenant and was captured within the gem upon her death. Her soul must still be bound to the gem, even in a shattered state. The relics react to you because of your soul being directly bound to Akatosh as kin of the Dove, your own dragon soul. 
I believe that if we were to bring together enough relics that tie to the Covenant, we may be able to appeal to Akatosh to actually reform the amulet. Alright, now we have to explain a lot of stuff. I didn't sense a lot, and I do mean a lot of things here, and only a few of them are important, so I'm going to summarize and expand on them where I can. So Arian tells us that the amulet is still bound with the son of Saint Elysia who made the original covenant with Akatosh, and even now that the amulet is shattered, her soul still exists there, and we need to find artifacts from two other people who are tied to the covenant to restore the relic, and the two artifacts we need belong to Riemann Cyrodiil and Tyrell Septim. Both of these figures are extremely complicated and require some further explaining, so I'm gonna give some further explaining. So Riemann Cyrodiil is one of the weirdest figures in the Elder Scrolls universe, he's the founder of the second Cyrodiilic Empire, and his origin may just be the most bizarre thing I have ever read in the Elder Scrolls universe, and I have read the lessons of Vivek. So let us read the first chapter of the Remenada, and in those days the Empire of Cyrodiil was dead, save in memory only, for through slag and famine and inequities rulers, they were split from the east and Colovia's estrangement lasted for four hundreds of years. Once worthy western kings of Arvil and Sarkarth, Farkrig and Delundil became through pride and habit as thief barons and forgot covenant. In the heartland things were no better, as Arcanists and Falsemoth princes lay in drunk stupor or in studies of vileness, and no one sat in the throne in dusted generations. Snakes and the warnings of snakes went unheeded and allowed bled with ghosts and deep set holes onto the cold harbors. And it is said that even the Chimel of the Bal, the amulet of kings and glory, had been lost and its people saw no reason in finding it. And it was in this darkness that King Thrall set out from the lands beyond the Lost Twill with a sortie of questing knights numbering 18 less 1, all of them western sons and daughters. For Thrall had seen in his visions all the snakes to come, and he sought to hear the borders of his forebearers. And to this host appeared at last a spirit who resembled none other than Elest. Queen of ancient times, who bore in her left hand the dragon fires of Akatosh, and in her right arms the jewels of the covenant, and in her breast a wound that spilled void onto her mangled feet. And seeing a less than Shimela Dabal, Hrol and his knights wailed and sat on their knees, and prayed for all things to become as right. Unto them the spirit said, I am the healer of all men, and the mother of dragons. But as you have run so many times from me, so shall I run until you learn my pain, which renders you and all this land dead. And the spirit fled from them, and they split amongst hills and forests to find her, all grieving that they had become as villainous people. Thrall and his shield then were the only ones to find her, and the king spoke to her, saying, I love you, sweet Alice, sweet wife of Shor and Oriel, and of the sacred bull, and I would render this land alive again, not through pain, but through the return of dragonfires of covenant, to join east and west, and through awful ruin. And the shield then bore witness to the spirit opening naked to his king, carving on a nearby rock the words, and Hrol did love unto the hillock before dying in the sight of their union. It's still a better love story than Twilight. When the 15 other knights found King Hrol, they saw him dead after his labor against the Mount of Mud, and they parted each in their own way, and some went mad, and the two that returned to their homeland beyond the Twill would say nothing of Hrol, and acted ashamed of him. But after nine months, the Mount of Mud had become a small mountain, and there were whispers among the shepherds and bulls. A small community of believers gathered around the growing hill during the days of the first churning, and they were the first to name it, the Golden Hill, Sankrator, and it was the shepherd as said Yina, who dared to climb the hill, when she heard his first cry, and at its peak she saw what it had yielded, an infant she named Raymond, which is Light of Man, and in the child's forehead was the Chimel of the Bar, alive with the dragon fires of yore and divine promise, and no doubt obstructed Yina when she climbed the steps of the White Gold Tower and placed the baby Raymond on his throne, where he spoke as an adult, saying, I am Cyrodiil Kham. Make of this story what you will, for it has already burned a hole in my brain and soul. It would be so funny if this was just the Elder Scrolls version of North Korean propaganda. You know how the North Koreans say that the Kims were born under a double rainbow that they invented cheeseburgers? Well, that's the kind of vibes I'm getting from this story. So we have Raymond's shield, but we also need to talk about Tiber Septum. Now, Tiber Septum is the most important character in the Elder Scrolls universe, and he's also severely complicated. First of all, no one knows what race he is. He is described and named as a Breton, Imperial, or North. There are two different accounts of his life, in one of whom he is described as a noble and powerful North with the power of the tomb, and in the year 854 of the Second Era, he conquered the Imperial City, but due to an assassination attempt on his life, his throat was slit, and he could no longer shout. He then conquered all the realms of men, and eventually forced the Tribunal of Morrowind to join the Empire, and Vivek even gave him the Numidium. He then powered said Numidium with his own soul, and with it he conquered Valen and the Somerset Isles. In the other report, he is described as a Breton from Alkira named Hjolti. According to it, he was an excellent tactician and a brilliant leader, but he had no concept of the tomb. Then one day, as he was sieging a well fortified settlement called Hrultan, Wolfarth, a lot more of him later, appeared before him, taught him, and advised him to use the voice. And after the siege, he was given the name Talos. Hjolti then married his only other opponent to the throne, who was a friend of his name Colkin, and Hjolti made it look like an assassination by setting the palace on fire and cutting himself. Following this murder and his ascension as emperor, he used two other people to help him run the empire as his advisors. Izmir Wulfath, who showed him to use the voice, 
and his battle mage, Zeran Arctus. I don't want to explain Wolfhard just yet because there is a lot you have to explain when it comes to him. He requires his own section, but I have to mention that he vehemently hated the Dark Elves and the Tribunal, and he wanted the newly formed Empire to crush them, but they didn't, and so he left Tiber Septum in bitterness. When Tiber got his hands on the new medium, he realized that he could not power it, and so he begged Wolfhard to come back by telling him that he was right all along, and that he knows nothing, and that he's nothing without him, and please honey come back, and he did come back, and then he trapped his soul in a soul gem known as the Mandela, and used it to pardon a medium, and with it, he conquered the rest of Tamriel. The end. Some say that he actually trapped his battle mage Zorus Actus in there, and other sources say that actually both souls are trapped in there, through a kind of weird merge. And we're gonna talk about the recent, more obvious topic of the dimensional merge. No matter whose soul was sucked in there, a part of that soul, a husk at least, managed to escape, that part became the Underking, and it cursed Tiber Septim's tomb in Sangrator for all eternity. The Underking actually plays a major role in Daggerfall, and it is actually a very resentful entity. He has this to say. Centuries ago, Tiber Septim ruled the land and forged an empire with the great Numidium. The secret of the Numidium's power lies in its heart, carried within the Mandela. It is the heart of Tiber Septim's battle mage. It is my heart. It is my Mandela. It is my totem. It belongs to me, and none other. Before we move on from Tiber Septum, I want to talk about the big elephant in the room. Tiber Septum, Hjolti, Talos, whatever you want to call him, most certainly had the power of Chim. It is never stated clearly how he got it, but come on, everyone who's ever touched the medium either ended up despawning, gaining Chim, or thinking they're the creators of the universe. This man explains some of the inconsistencies in his story. Famously, Vivek, who had a similar power, had this idea about wanting to become everything. So something similar may have happened here. Vivek is my brother. He knows my struggles, and I know his. That knowledge makes our relationship complicated. But that craves radical freedom. The death of all limits and restrictions. He wishes to be all things at all times. Every race, every gender, every hero, both divine and finite. But in the end, before I leave Tiber Septum, I want to dunk on Elder Scrolls lore a little bit, if you would allow me. You see, Tiber Septum erased all the jungles of Cyrodiil retroactively from history because the people of Cyrodiil really hated the jungle. He famously, and obnoxiously, stated this after he conquered Eleanor. You suffer from me to win this throne, and I see you hate the jungle. Let me show you the power of Talos Stormcrown. Oh, the power of Talos Stormcrown, born of the north, where my bread is long winter. I breathe now in royalty and reshape this land which is mine. I do this for you, red legions, for I love you. For he saw in us in each... He retroactively removed the jungles from existence, they still exist in the documents of history, and they still exist in the memory of the people that experienced them, but they were never there. Not the simplest concept to grasp, but far from the worst one in this game. Well, when the Elder Scrolls Online first came out, the map of Cyrodiil was not a jungle, so many people asked why, and Xenomax responded in the worst way possible, by saying that it was a translational error on the part of the scholars. You have a perfect in lore explanation for this event, and you go with this? People in the community, of course, hated this explanation. I remember even in videos that weren't necessarily talking about ESO lore, and were talking more about ESO as a game, people would still find the time to shit on this explanation. I feel like it would have been better if Xenomax just said, Lama, we don't know, kick W smiley face. That would have been better than this. Coincidentally, this part gives me the opportunity to talk about another part of ESO lore that fell flat. So, if anything else, at least I get to rag on some ESO lore. So Arena gives us an amulet used by the Elliots to teleport, and we use it to go to Sankrator, but the place is still cursed by the Underking. Inside Sankrator, we find this inscription, Within this place shall forever be sealed away the evils of the Underking, so that the spirit of the great Tiber Septum may forever contain his presence within. Bound to his sealed tomb by the three keyblades of the Dragon Guard, his tomb shall never again be open without them. Safeguarded within this fortress, these blades will have places of reverence within, only to be removed during the time of the turning of the wheel, when the dead walk again, and the Underking King's restless evil may once again stir. So we get the blades, then we also get Tiber Septim's helmet, and even release the Under King so we can kill him and get his stuff and ring. As we leave, a portal opens in the middle of the tomb, and this happens. The wayward son returns home. I am the voice. I 
am the I. I am the breath which makes Akatoshi's will be known. And you are his child, Dova King. You are the gatherer of the symbols of those who came before you. Brought here to beseech his lordship to do thine bidding. Humility you may have, yet the full offering you do not. The blood of the mother you have in full, yet the breath of the father you have yet to fully obtain. Go forth and make whole the symbols of the offering, so that the heart too may once again be made whole. So we then go back to Arian with this information, and he has this to say. Blood of the mother you have in full, yet breath of the father you have yet to fully obtain. Curious. Quite vexing. Well, the blood of the mother must pertain to Alessia, Raymon, and Tiber Septim, so if those are the symbols in full he spoke of, then that means there would be three more symbols under the breath of the father. Hmm. This is quite interesting. Well, yet to fully obtain would imply that some of the items you brought along must be symbols of Shore. He proceeds to say a lot in a very confusing manner, and it doesn't help that this is the part that the mod starts giving its own twist on the lore, so I'm gonna have to elaborate on my own special way again. So the whole thing about Breath of the Mother obviously refers to Alicia and her pact with Akatosh, and that pact is symbolized by her artifact, Tiber's artifact, and the artifact of Riemann. Yet the mod also makes the claim that the Amulet of Kings was made using both the blood of Lorcan and Akatosh. Now, there are two different theories about the origins of the amulet. One is that Akatosh made it directly using his own blood and then gave it to Alicia, and the other one is that when Trinema gripped Lorcan's heart out and Akatosh tied it to his bow and threw it at the Red Mountain, a droplet of his blood fell in a world of Magicka, and in time it created the stone on the amulet, aka the amulet is actually the blood of Lorcan. I cannot for the life of me accept that it's the blood of both, I can accept that it was actually Shor aka Lorcan who made the covenant because he hated the elves, and it also makes sense because Morak houses the son of Kain and Shor, according to a Nordic retelling at least, but I cannot for the life of me accept that the two beings who hate each other the most are both equally represented in this amulet. Also, Lorcan is supposed to be either dead or missing by this point. I I doubt Bro can exist without a heart. So, the Herald is implying that there are representations of six individuals who could make the amulet whole again. Three of these represent Akatosh, Alessia, Raymond, and Tiber Septum. The other three represent what I assume is Shaw. Zerin Arctis, Wolfarth, and if I am correct, Morahaus. Morahaus was, or still is, a demigod who was the husband of Alessia. His name means First Breath of Man, and is considered tied to Kine in that regard, and also is associated with the Thum, as is implicit in his name. But regardless, we'll get Morak House's armor from a random cave, and the last artifact left is the one which belongs to Izmir Wolfarth. I used to really like the story of Izmir Wolfarth, but then ESO ruined it. So, just so you know, I am currently saying the story with tears in my eyes. So Wolfarth was a king of Atmora and a king of Skyrim in the year 500 of the first era, and he restored the old Nordic pantheon while also outlawing the Elysian doctrines. I should also note that the Nordic pantheon and the Elysian doctrines aren't horribly dissimilar. Sure, the divines are named differently and the relationship between them is different, but Kain is still Kinnereth but Nordic, Tsur is basically Stendhal but Nordic, and Janal, um... Um, I'm not gonna talk about Janal. Why does this guy keep coming up? One of the main differences between the Nordic and the Elysian pantheons, however, is the way in which they have come to perceive Lorcan and Akatosh. See, the Nordic pantheon reveres Shore and it views Akatosh as a more antagonistic force, mostly because he's worshipped by elves and Nords don't really like elves, and also for the longest time their interactions with dragons was through Alduin, and so they have come to associate Alduin with Akatosh. So Wolfhard successfully managed to restore the worship of Shore in Skyrim. Wolfhard was also, much like any Nord, Fond of fighting against elves and orcs, there is a deity in the Nordic pantheon called Arke, who symbolizes death and decay, and Wolfarth used to fight with this deity very frequently, and in one of those battles, Orke summoned the ghost of Alduin. I don't know what that is, so here is a transparent image of Alduin. Anyway, this ghost turned the entire population of Skyrim into children, and Wolfarth pleaded with Shaw to save them, and Shaw did save them by teaching Wolfarth a new shout, which he used to age people back to their original age, but in the process of doing so, he aged himself as well. 
and then he died. Now, before we get going with the story, I want to take a step back and mention something. This entire story comes from the book Five Songs of King Wolfhath. And if you can't tell by the title, this book's aren't exactly historical documents. And this entire plot makes sense only if you suspend all possible disbelief you have. For starters, Orc is a weird perversion of Malakath and Arke. Mainly Malakath though. So how did Malakath gain the ability to spawn the ghost of Alduin? And why did a ghost decide to do something as random as suck people's ages? And I cannot stress this enough, Shor is supposed to be missing this whole time. We don't know where he is. In fact, there is a belief that he reincarnates himself without having any idea who he is either. And even people like the last Dragonborn, Pelno Whitestrake, and even the Reverend have all been hypothesized to be reincarnations of the Avatar of Shor, Shizarins, as they are referred to. Here I also want to touch on the point that this mod makes that the divines are unreal and that they are just reflections of what is happening and what is believed here on Ner. The truth of divinity resides in the will of the worshipper. Most of what is true in our world is because we simply choose it to be. Divines are only such because they are believed to be, and that faith powers them. Much of what exists in the heavens is mantled or reflected here on Nern. I cannot for the life of me support that claim. We know for a fact that both Adra and Daedra gain power from being worshipped, but their existence isn't inherently tied to it, which is the argument that this mod makes. Okay? That was a long tangent. Now let's get back to Wolfhath. So now we have to talk about his resurrections. Prior to the Battle of the Red Mountain, the Chimera and the Dwemer were stuck in a bit of conflict. Sensing this unrest, the Devil of Dagothar, again I have no idea what this looks like, so here's this transparent image of Dagothar, appeared before the Nords and told them that they could use this conflict to invade and reclaim the heart of their fallen god. So the Nords used the shout to recall Wolfhath to lead them. Yet the combined force of the Dwemer and the Chimera was too much for them, and Wolfhath was blasted into pieces by Vivek. It is said that Vivek blasted him to dust, Hence why he ended the Tale of Ash King, as after the battle and his defeat by Vivek, he became as a storm cloud of ash. And when he figured out what the tribunal was doing to the heart of his god, he became enraged at them. Enter why he left Tavar Septum's side when he refused to attack Morrowind. Now, this is where we get to the part that I think he is so messed up. During the Interagnum, he was reawakened to assist the Nords and the elves to fight against the second Akavir invasion. Some sources claim that it was even Anmalexia who woke him up. This makes, as we already established, no sense. Why would he listen to Anmalexia? He hates her. Some other sources claim that it was actually the High King of Skyrim that summoned them. Again, why wouldn't he just slap him and tell him, I don't respond to people that align themselves with the elves that tell me to dust and use the heart of my god to their own gains. I just feel like it's all over the place. But yet, I digress. After the battle, he went to Sovengar to sleep for a long while, and he only came back when the graveyard stole a prophecy that a new emperor would show up and defeat the elves. So giddy with excitement, he showed up to High Hrothgar where he was told that it was not him. But they also told him that he should be careful, as someone might just betray him. Anyway, he shows up to the real emperor, forgets everything the graveyards told him about betrayal, gets betrayed, and then his soul gets merged with Xeranactus in the Mandela, and we already know the rest from here. But as with Xeranactus, a part of himself isn't fully within the Mandela, and we find that part and kill it. Don't worry, this guy responds more frequently than the player character, and then bring the pieces back to the Herald. And this is what he has to say. The blood of the mother and the breath of the father bore by the one who is bound to both. You have brought forth symbols of the seven, and as such, the fragments of the Kinel Adabal shall be reforged. Though the covenant of Akatar shall never again be made, the stone shall once again serve to reinforce the world by bringing breath and blood to the White Gold Tower once more. I bestow this knowledge unto you. With it you shall take your rightful place among the seven. Use it wisely. Now go forth, one of seven. The wheel still turns, and your prophecy is yet unfulfilled. Some thoughts about what he just said. As I said, this quest is an interlude between Legacy of the Dragonborn and Odyssey of the Dragonborn. So this whole thing about wheel still turning and the first of the seven isn't important right now. And with that, the mod ends. For now at least. See you all in two years when Odyssey comes out. Overall, yeah, it's a good mod. Some people go to the beach for a summer vacation. Others go hiking. We? We curate a mod's lore. And you know what? It was buzzing. I hope you enjoyed it. I'm planning there to be a lot more videos like this in the future, so stay tuned. Hey Kotho, why do these videos take you so long? Have you been slacking off maybe? No, no I haven't. It's just the case that every time I decide to make one of these videos, the whole world comes crashing down on me. Stability is an important gift, my friends.
Cherish it. For to me, it is long gone. It is my ambition, however, that this month I'll be able to finish Wheels of Lot as well. So that's something to look forward to. Anything else? Anything else? Oh yeah, next video is on Skibbity Toilet and the great Skibbity Toilet Dragon Break. If you like the video, consider doing the things that people on YouTube tell you to do after you like their videos. And with all of the way, see- The story states that his father, King Hrol, begot him in a union with the spirit of Saint Alessia upon the site of Sangrator, the Golden Hill. The spirit was the land itself, and Hrol placed the Chim El Abadal into the dirt where his son was planted and then he died. 